to give this minute back to Brother Stetler. This is a minute early. Is that okay? We're very glad you're here on this, uh, what kind of day? Winter. Maybe they're going to give us some snow, maybe not. But uh, we're glad you're here. Uh, just yesterday, my wife and I were reading the Bible, and we read from Psalm 13. And uh, two verses there that are interesting. I have trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. I will sing unto the Lord, because he hath dealt bountifully with me. Well, it's God's providence that has brought us together today. And um, many here could testify you may have had a difficult week or a challenging week. Many could say this, that you were spared from accident and injury. And all of us can praise God for his abundant provisions to us. Yes. Um, we should praise him for the means of grace yes. that we can yes. draw spiritual uh, power from. Mm -hmm. yes. I'm glad for corporate worship, but it's so wonderful when we can meet with God quietly yes. in our homes yes. at any hour of the day or night, yes. and he's there to hear us. And it's a pleasure just to enter into his fellowship with prayer, and uh, we're going to do that in a little bit. But we want to praise him for this privilege yes. and invite him here. And let's ask the Lord to help us to let go of the things that hinder worship. It's so easy for us to think about tomorrow or this afternoon or if we turn the roast down or whatever it is. Now I already got you off. <laughs> but we need to uh, pray that God will meet with us. Let us stand for prayer, please. How we thank you, our Lord, that you brought us together on this beautiful day. How we thank you that we have a heart to worship you. How we thank you for every blessing that you have sent to us, O oh Lord. Help us today to reflect on your goodness, on your grace, and on what you may challenge us in our lives to do better and more for you. Bless the singing. Bless every part of this service. May we have a sense that God is with us, and we will praise you for all that you do. In Jesus' name, amen. Remain standing, please. I texted Brother Stetler and Brother Andrew Stroud and said, we're so glad you have some good women in your life so we can keep the church doors open. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, my, my mind works probably different than yours. But, uh, so, so good to be in God's house. I need to be here this morning. In a God, godly yes. place is all week long. We need a place to come. Worship him. Let's uh, start with that chorus. We've come to this house to call upon his name and worship him. Amen. Amen.
concentrate on what God wants us to get this morning. He's got something for us. Praise his name. Let's turn to number 71. I will sing of my Redeemer. Aren't you glad you redeemed this morning? Praise his name. Thank you. Number 71.
was thinking as I was watching you all while you were singing this morning. You know, the world wants to have a thrill. And it's not the thrill that we just sang about, is it? The thrill that I saw in these young people's hearts singing, the thrill of you middle-aged and, and beyond, it was kind of exciting to think about the fact that you know what a thrill is all about. You know what the real thrill is about. I'm sure there are some that are probably not quite as thrilled as they were yesterday over the Bengals' win, as they're probably mourning over what they might have imbibed over through the night. I'm glad we don't have to worry about that kind of thrill. The thrill that we can find out in Jesus Christ is just worth everything, young people. Nothing in the world like it. Nothing can compare. And I'm so thankful for the thrill that Jesus gives. I'm glad it can be the thrill that's way down deep in our soul this morning. Bless his name. I love him today. So grateful for what he's done. What he provides. I just want to give him praise and give him honor today. As you may have noticed, and you might have got your notifications about both of our pastors not feeling well this morning. And I appreciate the fact that they want to allow themselves to be sequestered, even though they don't think they have COVID, but they're just being precautious. And I appreciate that. I'm sure all of you do as well. But we do want to remember them in prayer. And as they, we know that they would love to be here this morning. But we're thankful that the Lord can touch them where they are. And let's pray that he'll do so. Today is just a little bit different day. Uh, we usually give recognition to this day of the sanctity of life, and we just want to make mention of that, and I'd like for Sister Carol to come if she would at this, at this time. Sister Carol does do a ministry for uh, at an organization that provides counter-abortion counseling, I guess we could say, <laughs> to try to give an alternative to uh, expectant mothers and we, you know, Sister Carol is going to share with us a little bit about uh, what she has on her heart and also about the sanctity of life. I prepared something to say today, and then this morning I thought of something that happened to me when I was a teenager, and I felt like, although I've never told um, about this in public, that I should share. Um, when I was about 15, um, my parents had come back to the States and we were staying with a missionary and I had gone out somewhere by myself and I heard a baby crying and you can say that I'm a lifesaver because that baby was taken up from um, where it was discarded and they held it up and showed it to me and asked me what I wanted to name it and so that was a very traumatic thing for me but um, the baby did not survive one of the three days. But, um, so you see why sanctity of life is so meaningful to me. Yeah. Um, it says, here I'm presenting for life. Um, there are many forms of life that are being presented when we say sanctity of life. Um, I've been a, an ad advocate at CareNet Pregnancy Care Center in Florence. And also, I wanted to share with you some facts. Um, the Word of God says, I am fearfully and wonderfully made, Psalms 139, 14. C.S. Lewis said, and I think this kind of goes along with some things um, Brother Sankey said this morning in his Sunday school lesson. C.S. Lewis said, children are not a distraction from important work. They are the most important work. And um, I'm going to go on to some other things that... Um, from different places that I researched. A meme by Students for Life, a group caught the attention of Pastor Stroud, and he wanted me to speak about this when he saw this meme. And the meme said, in the first eight days of January 2022, the global count of abortions has passed one million. It is said, in the first eight days of 2022, the global count of abortions has passed one million. Um, I think of that baby that was held up to me. You know, that was a full-term baby, but um, God knows all about that. A friend of mine locally who is an advocate for uh, life, also at Care Net Pregnancy Center, 
She attends a church here in Burlington, not of our faith. She wanted me to tell you a couple things. Um, she, so I want you to know it's not from a holiness perspective, but she said 54% of abortions are done by people who are Christian. That's a little bit hard to swallow. Um, and another thing she said was, in our, our culture argues that the circumstances surrounding a pregnancy can be a reason for abortion, but no circumstance, hardship, or challenge changes the value or the right to life of a baby. Circumstances don't determine value. And I found this from Focus on the Family. This is what I believe we believe, but it's by Focus on the Family. We believe human beings are created by God in his image. Therefore, every person from, from conception to natural death possesses inherent dignity and immeasurable worth, including preborn children, elderly individuals, those who, with special needs, and others marginal, marginalized by society. Christians then are called to defend, protect, and value all human life. And then I wrote again, so, um, focus on the family, have the verse, Psalms 139, 11. I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderful, wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and that my soul knoweth right well. This was um, taken from uh, someone who is a public figure. Her name is Lila Rose. Uh, she also started a foundation um, at live action. In one wing of an American hospital, in one wing of American hospitals, doctors carefully tend to a preemie in NIC ICU, in an ICU, born at just 24 weeks, fighting for his, her life. In another wing of the very same hospital, um, doctors inject the heart of a 24-week-old baby and dismember the child apart. And there is also from live action um, another thing about Roe versus Wade. It talks about there's a lie about this. It says, the lie says, the 14th Amendment of the Constitution guarantees the right to abortion. But the truth is, the truth, the right to kill a child is nowhere in the U.S. Constitution. The 14th Amendment plainly says that no state is allowed to deprive the person of life, liberty, or property without the process of law. Understood in a proper historical context and constitutional basis, that means abortion should, should be illegal in all 50 states. And every child should have the complete should have the complete and constitutional basis that means abortion should be illegal in all 50 states. I, I lost my place, I'm sorry. So Roe versus Wade is the lie of the land and not the law. Um, a pie chart I saw, um, it talked about the annual deaths in the US accidents um, were 121,000, cancer, five. 180,000, heart disease, 600,000, but abortion deaths, 1.5 million in the U.S. It's hard to imagine that. Lord, have mercy on us. We don't deserve the mercy, but we're begging and pleading. Have you thought about how you could help, how you could be an advocate for life? Um, we do the baby bottle campaign, and I thank you for those of you who have participated in that. And there's other ways, too. Um, there's the March for Life. Um, this week, um, my friend uh, Melissa is taking about, I think, 16, 15 or 16 people to Washington, D.C. Um, to March for, the, March for Life on Friday, Feb Friday, January 21st. And we could pray for them. Prayer is an important way that we can um, participate in <coughs> this uh, concern and also we can pray that Roe versus Wade will be overturned and um, at this time Brother Tolman is going to come and lead us in prayer or talk to us about prayer. 
Thank you, Carol. Appreciate those facts that was given, and hopefully it'll give us a more in-depth awareness of this awful scourge of this nation. I'm sure all of us have similar feelings in regards to that, but we do want to remember these, uh, these precious children and the families and those that are deciding to allow this to happen in their life. It's just, the impact is going to be lifelong, and let's, let's pray for these people. Coupled with that, is, as we do want to make that the main emphasis of our prayer this morning, I'd like for us uh, to stand together. We'll just join together with, in regards to this special need that has been presented to us. And coupled with that, we want to remember the, the, um, our pastors today, that the Lord will touch them. And maybe you might have a request you would like to share this morning. Anyone have anything at all? Yes. I uh, had a uh, call from my aunt Charlene. Uh, she is you know, recovering from COVID quarantine. And I'm trying to get a hold of my mom. The thing is, I let my mom know she's trying to get a hold of her. But mom gets everything in five seconds. So, so that's probably what happened there. So let's pray for her. I also, my manager, Kendall, her family are all quarantined with COVID too. Yes. So, Anyone else? Okay. All right. Anything else? Just remember the GBS revival. Um, got to be there Friday night. Such a precious service. Let's uh, continue to pray for Brother Hutchinson and those in leadership there and the young people there that got help. And sought help, and those are yet to get help. Yes, Joe. Unsaved children. Unsaved children. I'm sure, that many could join with Joe in that same prayer. Sister yes. Hill's, I'm sorry, oh, go ahead. Sister Hill and Miranda both are trying to get over a sickness. Yes. Okay. Miranda's with us this morning, but let's. Well, we want to keep praying for her. Yes. And Linda. Let's join together. Father, we're glad that we can come to you this morning. We're thankful, Lord, for your divine presence that we feel in our hearts already. We just pray that you would take charge of the service. We're thankful, Lord, for what you have already allowed us to feel. And the songs we can sing about you and the songs of praise and honor that we want to give to your holy name. We think and we we're thankful for what Sister Carol has shared with us, Lord, this morning. And our hearts are burdened and our hearts are concerned for our nation and the attitude that many in our nation have toward the sanctity of life. And we just pray that, Father, you would give us awareness and help our politicians, Lord, and help our people. But even deeper than that, help us on a personal level that we can, just as Sister Carol shared, that we would do what we can to join in and to help support and to be able to give the needed prayer, Lord, that's needed to help this terrible scourge that's plaguing, plaguing our nation. We ask that you would help those mothers that are in the throes of decision this morning, that, Lord, they would value what they have inside of them, and we just pray that they would make the choice for life. And we pray that those that are counseling with those that are in that condition, we just pray that you would touch them today and give them the right words to say that this precious life could be saved. And and we pray that you would help, Lord, the parents across this nation. And that, that you would help and give guidance and direction, Lord, that we can do our best to raise these children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. And we just ask that you would give us a revival amongst the families our brother shared in the Sunday school class today. We ask that you would do so, God, and help us to be able to understand the value and the need of the family and to getting all of us around the family altar and getting us, Lord, pointing toward the thoughts and the, the premises of thy word, O oh God, and thy promises that you have for us. We pray that you would help, dear God, today. We're glad for this gathering that we have. 
Remember our pastors, Lord, Brother Andy, Brother Darrell, Lord, as they would love to be here, but we pray that you would help and touch them, dear God, physically. And we pray that they would get a full restoration to their health and, and get them back into the ministry. We pray here that they could serve. And we love them dearly and appreciate their lives and appreciate their ministry and continue to touch them, we pray today. Even now, may they sense the help of God in their life. And we're thankful, dear God. We appreciate our brother Witt that is Lord going to be ministering to us later. We pray that you would touch him today as he ministers and give him that anointing, Lord. Bless the GBS revival. We pray that you bless the ministry there, Brother Hutchinson and those that are sharing there. We pray that you would touch the young people, give them lasting and long victory, we pray in their soul. And we appreciate the fact that you are interested in giving them an experience of their own. And have thy precious right of way. And we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank the Lord. Thank the Lord for the time that we can join together in prayer. By way of announcement, we, we do want to remind you of the fact that tonight, in combination to what could possibly be bad weather and our pastor's not feeling well and also giving you, opening you the invitation of going to GBS tonight, there will be no service here at Burlington tonight. I want to remind you of the Tuesday evening Revelation series. I trust that you will take advantage of this. Uh, Brother Smith's a wonderful man. Uh, he has a very interesting way. Of course, his smile is so inviting, isn't it? I mean, he, you, he's got you with his smile. But yet, uh, his I, I enjoy his little interspersing of humor. Uh, he has an unusual way of doing that, and it's been very enjoyable, but yet I'm thankful for the content of this study, and I trust that you will avail yourself of that opportunity of being with us this coming Tuesday and the following Tuesday. And the youth convention trip is January 28 through 31. Let's be much in prayer for that. Always good reports of that. Always good results that are given. So let's keep that on our prayer list and those that are planning to go. We just pray that all that will come together. There is going to be a ladies Bible study at the beginning of February 8th. We just want to let you know of that and I trust you'll keep that in mind. As we approach uh, spring, could we say? <laughs> uh, you'll see the cards, our, our cards, uh, the friends and family. And I appreciate the thought of what they're doing this year, which is kind of good. Taking away another excuse for people not being able to come is that they're gonna spread it all through the month of March. So that's a great idea. So let's, let's remember all of that endeavors. As far as friends and family, March 6, 13, 20, and 27. Let's keep that on our prayer list. I was thinking about how we are still enjoying some families that we receive during oh, yeah. friends and family, aren't we? Yeah. And I think it was of the Lord for us to get this started and yeah. put it on the hearts of our pastoral team. And I'm glad it's continuing. And let's pray for maybe a couple more families yeah. this coming month. Yeah. And we can always use them, and we're always grateful for the fact of that. All right, I believe I have most of the announcements there. Uh, you can avail yourself of the cards out there in the foyer, and let's uh, keep this on our prayers. All right, I believe Sister Cheryl is going to share with us, after which Brother Witt will be bringing the morning message. God bless special today with the lower crowd. <laughs> not really. Mama said, you won't mind to sing on the lower crowd, would you? I said, oh, of course not. So, but I don't know if I sing by myself. This song is one that I'll sing a lot of times when I'm walking around my house um, cleaning. And if you ever get me to sing it, I'll probably sing it for two days straight. So my family will hear this one for a while. But it just really kind of resonates with my heart. The basic message is, when I come to prayer, I don't always even know what to say, don't always know how to ask or what is God's will, but sometimes you just have to talk to Him. You just kind of feel like, you know what, I just need to have a conversation 
with God. I may not even have something specific to ask or even know what to ask. But this song sort of talks about that. I know some of you probably have felt that way. Maybe you stumbled in the door this morning and you sort of feel like this song today.
Let's remember to pray for children. We know what's on our heart. I believe the children would like to go to a junior church. Hate to lose them. to uh, follow the theme of the sanctity of life and uh, I have a number of scriptures in my uh, message but I will read from Deuteronomy 30 and verse 19 and of course this is uh, Israel just on the verge of going into uh, Canaan and so on but uh, a lot of advice that the Lord gave to Israelites and to uh, make the right choices and we know they didn't mm -hmm. do that but um, this is kind of taken out of that context Deuteronomy 30 19 I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death blessing and cursing therefore choose life that thou that both thou and thy seed may live. I would like to say emphatically that God is pro-life. And uh, we as believers are to be pro-life people. And uh, I think there's something that, uh, this isn't my message, so don't count it against my time yet. Um, I think there is something that really, really perturbs me greatly in our world is the, the um, fascination with death. And you, you see people that have skulls on their shirts and, and uh, on their cars, and there's just this weird fascination with death. Well, I, I'm here to say God's pro-life. And uh, I, I have a real problem when I see some Christian young person that decides they have to have a big skull on their shirt. And if you happen to wear one of those sometime and I see it, don't be surprised if I don't say something. Because it really bothers me. I just think, uh, hey, I'm about life. I met the author of life, the sustainer of life. And... Uh, I want to live for him, and I want to make my life count for him. Let us pray again. We thank you, our Father, for your presence that we feel this day. We thank you for the assurance that you are with us to provide for us and to help us and to guide us along life's path. And we thank you, dear Lord, for this church and the life that we see in it and uh, the hope that we have not only for life here and now and abundant life here but eternal life in the future yes. bless now your word to us and may there be something said today that will inspire us and help us and to uh, keep us promoting life in jesus amen have you ever um, done a piece of needlework or woodwork or ceramics for someone special to you or for yourself? 
Or what about, uh, maybe you had a part in starting some kind of an organization or a campaign. We know this, that when you invest in those kind of things, that you have a special place in your heart uh, for creating and, and uh, presenting things to people. And I would guess that every individual here has something in your home that somebody has made for you that is special and you couldn't get rid of it under any terms. Your kids will when you're gone, they won't even care, but, uh, <clears throat> but you keep it and uh, it will be in your hands. Well, imagine how God must uh, feel when he shapes each one of us in the womb and then in many instances, those in the womb are just thrown away. Uh, perhaps you uh, know of someone or have known of someone who was carrying a child and the expert said, this child is going to be less than perfect. What often is suggested, abortion. Uh, we have some family members uh, very close to us that the doctor said, this child is not going to be a good child and you need to think about abortion. And uh, this young woman and her husband emphatically said, this is not an option. It will not be considered. Well, this poor little child that was not going to be perfect, I think has made the honor roll all through his life. And, uh, I can't tell from my observation there's anything abnormal about the kid. And uh, even if that child had come and hadn't been perfect, those parents were going to care for that child. Some years ago, a survey was done by the Guttenmacher Research. They happened to be involved with Planned Parenthood. And one of the things that came out of that research is that 74% of the women who chose abortion just chose it on the, mat on the mat matter of convenience alone. Forgetting all the other so-called legitimate reasons. Um, you, I put that in quotes, I hope you noticed that. But uh, that's shocking and that's, that's terrible. Uh, C. Everett Coop Formerly, the Surgeon General uh, stated that in his 35 years of practicing medicine, he said, never once did a case come across my practice where abortion was necessary to save a mother's life. Now, I read an interesting story of a professor in a medical school who once uh, posed this medical slash ethical problem to his students. He said, here's the family history. The father has syphilis. The mother has tuberculosis. They already have four children. The first child is blind. The second child died. The third is deaf. The fourth has TB. Now the mother is pregnant again. The parents come to you for advice. They're willing to have an abortion if you will decide that they should. What would you say? The students uh, gave uh, various um, individual opinions and then the professor asked them to break into small groups for consultation. And all of the groups came back to report that they would recommend abortion. Here's what the professor said. Congratulations, you just took the life of Beethoven. We need to remember that God has plans that supersedes man's wisdom. 
people think their answers, their solutions, their viewpoints are at least equal to, if not superior to God's. We decide which unborn children should be given the opportunity of life. We decide when someone's life is no longer useful or has sufficient quality to be allowed to continue. And while we have few states in our country where euthanasia is actually official, we know how to hasten people on to eternity. <clears throat> Once we decide that the preborn or the elderly or the disabled or the terminally ill are only problems uh, to us with no value, then it's all too easy to dispose of them. You know, meanwhile, God's heart aches and he says, for as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Isaiah 55, 9. He has a purpose that we often do not see or understand. Let's mention several things today here of, of importance to us as believers, as pro-life people. I hope you all are. Yes, yes. Life is sacred because God made it. Yes. Sacred because God made it. It was created by God. And as I said, I have a number of scriptures. I do not apologize for that. Genesis 1, 27 said, So God created man in his own image, in the image of God created he him, male and female created he them. That has become controversial language in this day and age, but it is still just as true as it was written long ago. We notice as well that <clears throat> it life is protected by God. Job 10, 12 says, Thou hast granted me life and favor, and thy visitation hath preserved my spirit. We often uh, refer to the fact that we believe we're protected by God, even by angels, and we have good ground for that. Psalm 91, 11 says, for he shall give his angels charge over thee to keep thee in all thy ways. Thank God for that. I have pestered my wife and still do. And uh, many times I will say, honey, when she's helping me drive, and she has. I said, my dear, uh, I have driven thousands of miles and you were not in the car. Yes, I know, but she said, uh, that's when the angels take over. <laughs> we are protected by God, thank God. Life is valued by God. Psalm 49, 16 says something that is really wonderful. It says here, Behold, I have graven thee upon the palms of my hands. Think of that. God is looking down. Ah, David Stamper, David Weddle, Brother yes. Sankey, yes. Brother Rob Scott, yes. on the palms of his hands. Yes. He cares for us. Yes. Life is valued by God. Jeremiah 1, 5 says, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee. And before thou camest out, Forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee and ordained thee a prophet unto the nations. We can't all claim all of that verse, but we can claim this, that even before we were born, God had a purpose for us as individuals, for you, and you need to remember that. John... <clears throat> 10 and 10 says, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. 
I want to say second here that life is sacred no matter what its condition might be. Some of you will go home and discuss that. That's fine. Life is a challenge in its sin-tainted world. It really be, would be wonderful if Adam and Eve hadn't sinned, but they did. And uh, unfortunately, sin came into the world, and with it came pain and imperfection and injustice, etc. We could go on. And God warned us of these challenges, and uh, yet He enables us to trust Him to be victorious through the challenges that come in our life. And I thank God for people who are sitting right here who have been through some major challenges and they have testified that God has been with them and is with them. We can, as 1 Peter 5, 7 said, we can cast our care on him because he cares for us. James says something that I don't think we get too excited about, but um, he says, my brother, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations or testing. Why? Really, it's because of the presence of God. We can be safe in those conditions. Jesus <clears throat> said in John 16, 33, these things I have spoken unto you that in me, you might have peace. In the world, you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. You know, <clears throat> life is sacred no matter what the condition it might be, and we must not overlook those who have challenges in this life. If you haven't had any, I have some news for you. You will. They come. Jesus showed special concern for the lame and the blind and the woman with the issue of blood, the lepers. And in our day, we must not forget. We must not forget the woman in crisis confronted with an unplanned pregnancy or an abnormal embryo that says there will be Down syndrome. It's interesting that about 90% of the couples who are faced with the amniocentesis report of probable Down syndrome decide to abort, about 90%. Do you know anyone who has a Down syndrome child who doesn't tell you that this child is the light of their life? the absolute joy, the most loving person you've ever known. I remember a long time ago in my childhood that a woman in the church that we were attending had twins. They came along a little late in her life. Those twins named Johnny and Jimmy were born when she was uh, getting a bit older. Johnny was normal. Jimmy had Down syndrome. And the dear lady was told much later, several years later, she said, I wish I'd had two Jimmys. Johnny has broken my heart, but Jimmy has always loved me and always loved Jesus. Sometimes we would throw away what God would bring into our lives as blessing. We must not forget the post-abortive woman who struggles with the reality that she consented to her baby's death. There are many hurting women around the world who have made that decision. It isn't our job to condemn them. They already feel condemned. They need love as well. We must not forget the post-abortive father who walked away from the reality of his sin. 
We must not forget the terminally ill or aged who has been forgotten or who has outlived many of their family and friends. We might get there ourselves someday. We must not forget the disabled and the disadvantaged. There are people all around us who need to be lifted. Max Lucado uh, told in his book, the, the Applause of Heaven, about a sweater that hangs in his closet. He said he seldom wears it. It's too small. The sleeves are too short. The shoulders are too tight. And some of the buttons are missing. And the thread is frazzled. He said logically, I should throw out that sweater because he, he said, I have no use for it and I will probably never wear it again. It simply takes up closet space. What's the logic, he says. But love, he reports, won't let me let him. Why not? What's unusual about the sweater? Well, to start with, it has no label no tag telling you wash in cold water. <laughs> That's because it wasn't made in a factory or produced on assembly line as a product of a nameless employee earning a living. He said, rather, it was a creation of a devoted mother expressing her love, his mother. Uh, the sweater is unique, one of a kind, irreplaceable, and each strand was chosen with care and each thread selected with affection. And so, even though that sweater has lost its use, it has lost none of its value. It's valuable not because of its function, but because of its maker. So it is with life. Let that sink in. We must not forget the lonely and the emotionally distraught, they're around us. They have, they have life. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch of, as ye have done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Matthew 25, 40. You know, our Lord places great value on those who whom society has shuffled aside. Uh, while on his knees, the leper begged Jesus to make him clean. And the Bible says in Mark 1, and Jesus moved with compassion, put forth his hand and touched him and said unto him, I will be thou clean. You know, we are God's hands and his heart to the desperate, searching humanity. Much of humanity needs what we experience very often, and that is they need love. Sometimes it would help, and this isn't in my notes, it would help just to give people a smile. It might not hurt to give them a pat on the back. It um, might well have been easy for someone to suggest that a little girl named Fanny Jane should be put quietly away because she was unable to make any valuable contribution to society. <coughs> However, we read of the hymn writer Fanny Jane Crosby, who gave us more than 8,000 gospel songs. Although she was blinded at age six weeks, she didn't have bitterness in her heart because of it. And once a preacher sympathetically remarked, I think that it's a pity that the master did not give you sight when he showered you with so many other blessings. Her response was, do you know that if at birth I had been able to make one petition, it would have been that I should be born blind. Why, the clergyman said, 
because when I get to heaven, the first face that I shall ever, that shall ever glad my sight will be that of my Savior. And that wonderful song, my Savior first of all, was written by her. You know, another important thing that we must remember is that life is sacred because of its eternal nature. We are creatures of eternity. We will exist somewhere for all eternity. We're not going to die like your pet dog and be gone. Maybe, oh, I don't want to get on there. Somebody's going to ask me, is your dog going to be in heaven? I will tell you about that, children. It's like this. God's going to have everything you need in heaven. Is that okay? Is that a good theological answer? I've had children and grandchildren, okay. Didn't mean to go down that road. But we're going to exist somewhere through all eternity. Uh, life exists before we enter this material world. Carol mentioned uh, Psalm 139, uh, 15 and 16 in her writing. And I'll repeat it. It'll be now heard three times. My substance was not hid from thee when I was made in secret, curiously wrought in the lowest parts of the earth. Thine eyes did see my substance, yet being unperfect, and in thy book all my members were written, which in continuance are fashioned, when as yet there was none of them. God was working in the background. And for some of us who were born way back there before, a lot of things were around. Nobody had any idea whether we were coming as a boy or a girl. I mean, they just said, oh good, here's a baby. <laughs> and in a little bit, they figured it out. <laughs> You know, uh, there is life at new birth. Jesus said in John 3 and 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. But at the new birth, there's life. And if you can just transport yourself back to the moment when God saved you, think of that wonderful moment. That's a long ways back for me. Mm -hmm. Eight years old, mm -hmm. almost 62 years, a little more than. Thank God for that moment when he came into my heart. What a change it has done for my life. You know, our earthly life is simply a prelude to eternity. Hebrews 9.27 reminds us that as it has pointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, we're all going to face eternity. Jesus said in John 14 and 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. 1 John 5.13 These things have I written unto you that ye that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have life eternal, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. In other words, we can know and be assured of abundant life while on the earth, and everlasting life in eternity with Christ. I believe we can have that assurance. There is no reason for us to fail and to fall out of the, the family of God. We can live for him. He gives us that power. I want to uh, conclude by giving a little illustration that was given by a speaker in a seminar a number of years ago in that room where it was given the seminar to a people of a crowd of 200. He held up a $20 bill. I don't have one in my pocket because some of you would take me up on this deal. 
But uh, <clears throat> he asked, when he held up that money, he said, who would like this $20 bill? Well, there were hands all around the room, people that would like to have that $20 bill. He said, I'm going to give the $20 bill to one of you, but let, but let me first do this. And he took the $20 bill and he crumpled it up in his hand. And he said, who wants the $20 bill? And there were still hands going up all over the room. Well, he replied, what if I do this? And he dropped it on the ground and he began to grind it into the floor with his shoe. And then he reached down and picked it up now crumpled and dirty, and he said, who wants it? And there were still hands in the air. He said, my friends, you have all learned a very, very valuable lesson. No matter what I did with the money, you still wanted it because it did not decrease its value at all. It was still worth $20, regardless of what had happened to it. Well, many times in our lives, we're dropped and we're crumpled and uh, ground into the dirt by the decisions we make and by the circumstances that come our way. We feel as though we're worthless sometimes. But no matter what has happened or what will happen, we will never lose our value in the eyes of God. To Him, dirty or clean, crumpled or finally creased, you are priceless. You are priceless. You know, um, the worth of our lives, you might need to remember this more than anything I say. The worth of our lives comes not from what we do or who we are, but from whose we are. God created you. Don't ever forget that. Now I want to do something different in this service. Don't, don't leave, please. I want you to listen closely. But I want you to say to the person beside you, you are important because God made you and you owe your life to him. Do it. Do it aloud, whisper it, whatever, but do it. You're important because God made you and you owe your life to him. I don't want anyone left out. Did anybody get left out? Does somebody need to come and tell you that? You are important because God made you and you owe your life to him. And then I want you to say something else that may be harder. I want you to say this. I am important because God made me and I belong to him. Say it out loud if you need to. I am important because God made me and I belong to him. You know, all human life is valuable because God creates and sustains it. In his own image, for his own purpose, his sacred image, his sacred purpose, now those are his ways, which Isaiah tells us are much higher than ours. We need to remember that all life is important wherever you are in life from the very youngest on the second seat to the very oldest you know it's very easy for us when we get older I've gotten close to getting older I'm in my eighth decade can you believe that but when we get older we look back and we think I can't do that anymore and we begin to think we're not valuable. And then we forget that maybe we did touch a couple of lives 
And sometimes we forget that. But you know, God still has a purpose for us. He can still use us wherever we are in life. As puzzling as that may be. I just thought of a story. And this will be the end of my message, I hope, and you may too. But I had a very dear, great aunt. She was a very, very conservative woman. But she was a woman who loved God with all of her heart. She and her husband and her daughter, they were people who ran a great sea dairy. In other words, it wasn't mechanized. They milked a lot of cows every day, morning and night. They were so conservative, and you can decide whatever you want about that, they never sold one drop of Sunday milk, even though they knew the cows needed to be milked on Sunday. The pigs got a treat that day. But I just tell you that, just to tell you that they were just conservative people that loved God. And they prayed and they believed God. And my <clears throat> dear great aunt, I was not there, but she was in a little camp meeting to the east of El Dorado Springs, Missouri. Herman Chapel Camp, you have to know where it is to know it's there and appreciate it. But my dear Aunt Ethel, just as she often did, the Lord spoke to her and Aunt Ethel couldn't be quiet. She shouted all around the tabernacle, praising God and nobody had to doubt Aunt Ethel. She loved Jesus. Well, Aunt Ethel <clears throat> went home from camp meeting that night, and as she always did, she knelt beside her bed to pray. One of her sisters called the house the next day and said they wanted to speak to Ethel, but the phone rang, and it rang, and it rang, and it rang. And someone decided maybe Maybe we ought to go check on Ethel. Well, they got in and Ethel was there by her bed where she had been praying the night before, as was her habit. She hadn't passed away. She was still there, but just simply couldn't move. Well, they took Aunt Ethel to one of the local nursing homes. And Aunt Ethel was put there to bed. She had to be taken care of just like a little child. She could not speak. Um, she was just there. She could still smile. And um, <clears throat> she lived like that. And some people would have said, six months of wasted time in a bed, but she lived like that for six months. And it was interesting, if we looked at that, we would think, why in the world, why didn't God just let her go to heaven? Maybe we don't know all of the reason yet, but the nurses and the staff said that every time they got to Ethel's room, they said they just felt like it was the best fuel to heaven. Why? Why would God let that happen? Perhaps he was giving a message, a strong message to people who simply had forgotten God in their lives. And God was speaking through this silent woman who couldn't even tell them good morning, who couldn't say thank you, but she could smile. And they felt they were at the vestibule of heaven. We don't know what we may face in our lives, but you are valuable to God. And 
you have a purpose and God will help you carry out that purpose if you'll just let, let him do it through your life. Shall we stand, please? How we thank you, our Father, <clears throat> that you are the author of life. How we thank you, our Father, that you are pro-life. And how we thank you, Lord, that every person here is here for a purpose, here for a reason. And we ask that you will live that reason through us and may our lives so tell for Jesus that we can be a witness even if we cannot give the word that we would like to give. Dismiss us now with your blessings and favor. Touch the lives of our pastors and help this week to be a week of blessing in you. In Jesus' name, amen.